So I've spent um, my entire life on this question, but actually all facets of this question. The, the first part was building a toolkit that I didn't even know I was gonna answer or even address this question. The second part was actually figuring out the question. And the third has been a, a journey of a lifetime to work with a miraculous group of people uh, here in Silicon Valley and all over the world uh, to tackle this. How does biological energy work? Now, I'm not uh, the first person to ask this question. In fact, if you really go back to 1965, uh, a gentleman by the name of James Lovelock asked this in a, in a fairly orthogonal way. And what Lovelock asked was a very simple question. It was, if you were going to go look somewhere in the universe for signs of life, and it didn't have the form we know it, or that form was not there, what would you look for? And what Lovelock figured out, and it's not very complicated from first principles, is you would go back to the laws of thermodynamics and understand that if you had life, if you had a semblance of life, you had to have had energy. And if you had had energy, you would have had to have been able to convert that energy to what we see as order, and that order would express itself as life. And so what Lovelock prescribed was that if you were going to look for life, look for signs of order. Order. Thermodynamicists call that entropy, or more specifically, negative entropy. Now, we know an immense amount about biological energy as the noun. Uh, we know that energy is made uh, for humans in a little uh, gizmo there on the right called the mitochondria. And we know, uh, especially as we, with the advent of modern genomics, how this little thing evolved. We effectively trap energy either from inorganic material or the sun to create a lithium hydride battery. Biology's version of that is NADH hydride. And we run it down a little electron transport system and we catch it with oxygen, a miracle of photosynthesis, which wasn't here when we started, to create ATP, which is the universal energy molecule of, um, of biology. Now, we know a lot about how energy is made, but interestingly, we actually know very, very little about how it came about, specifically the biological energy piece, and how it interchanges with this thing called order. Where did this process start? What was that point in time that inorganic material or sunshine the core building blocks in the universe became life. How did that occur? Now in 2014, a gentleman uh, who runs a very large pharmaceutical company in Japan asked me an intriguing question. And it started me on a quest to be able to define what the essence of innovation is. And the gentleman's name was Tadasan, and he asked me to present a talk in Osaka entitled Innovation, and wanted to get at a very simple question, which was how do you build an innovation company? And that seemed to be such an easy question to answer, and I did. And so what I wanna share with you for the next few moments is what I presented, at least in snippets, to about 4,000 scientists and uh, physicians all over the world, part of the Sumitomo uh, <clears throat> pharmaceutical company, uh, about my view on, on, uh, on innovation and where it came from. So I've had a, a very fortunate uh, journey uh, through my career. Uh, it was influenced heavily by not only places I was at, but the people that were there. When I was a college student, I spent two summers out at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and was able to work with doctors by day who at night were scientists. They were trying to reconcile the diseases that people were suffering from with scientific-based solutions. This was the genius of the Mayo Clinic, a translational hub of science and medicine. 
My path took me many years later to the University of Chicago in the Department of Surgery, which had its claim of the only Nobel laureate in surgery and laboratories right next to the operating rooms to use critical thinking to solve some of the world's hardest and toughest problems. I learned from mentors such as George Block, who did the first removal of a pancreatic tumor that Best and Banting ultimately sequenced insulin to create cures for people with diabetes. I think the most impressionable place I was ever at was Johns Hopkins. When you walk into that dome, there is a very large figure of Jesus, and you learn very quickly the word devotion. But it wasn't the devotion to a religion. The religion was your patient. You learned night and day what Osler said. The secret for caring for the patient is to care for the patient. There is no shortcut for that process. As I say, while somewhat minding my own business, I was writing a uh, Culpepper grant, being a nominee from, from Johns Hopkins, and that grant was entitled Mathematical Models of Energy Metabolism. It was a, a byproduct of work I had done at University of Chicago. Not long after I wrote that grant, I got a call from a gentleman named Ira Skernick at DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, who said to me, would I like to start a company to figure out suspended animation? Would I like to reconcile my entire past in chemistry to apply that basic science to understand how the brain works to develop solutions not only for soldiers who were injured in combat settings, but also for a myriad of non-combat applications, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's stroke. Within 20 days, I left Hopkins. My dream was to be an MD, PhD at one of the nation's top universities. And in 20 days, all of my belongings were in a van, and I was never to return. I came to Silicon Valley. That day was my destiny. I knew that that was my problem. I was a solution looking for it. The problem was the intersection of electrons, the basic energy unit of life, and biology. From there, I uh, had wonderful mentors uh, as I built several companies, all focused thematically on the same problem. A gentleman who was on one of my early boards, Peter Morris, was actively involved in innovation at Procter & Gamble and taught me day by day the criticality of a plan in the form of a vision, goals, objectives, strategies, tactics, and metrics, and how to build that plan. Lastly, um, I had uh, a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience with a gentleman by the name of Leigh Thompson at Eli Lilly, who was their head of R&D who determined that more people ultimately died of disease by simply not trying. That in the act of doing nothing, you were doing harm. And so the credo of first do no harm, harm could be nothing. And Lay devised a very clear heuristic and methodology to look carefully at understanding how, in fact, to develop first-in-class drugs for horrific diseases. Now, when I sat back uh, after I gave a dry run of this talk a, a few weeks ago for Anne and her team, uh, I sent an email over to Anne Zapecki, and I said, well, what did you think of the, uh, the talk? Did I, did I hit the points you wanted to? And I got, for folks who know Anne, a very clear and organized message back. And essentially, the answer was no. She would have told me that you told me the, the, the what or the how, but you haven't really told me the essence. And so I told Todd Hassan how I mechanically built an innovation company. But I hadn't really addressed what was probably more fundamental, which is why. 
why, why would I put all of my belongings in a moving van and move cross country? What was it that propelled me to do that? And so the question I think that Anne Zapecki was really asking me was why do I innovate? What is it in a person that brings them to innovate? What is the essence? Where does that come from? I told you earlier my entire path was to develop a set of tools which I presented to you, codify a question, which was actually codified for me, but I was present to hear it from DARPA, and then to try to solve it. Well, given the homework assignment that, that Ann Zapecki laid out for me, uh, I thought long and hard about this. Uh, I thought, what really was it? What was the essence for me of innovation? And in a, in a very nonlinear way, which is how we are programmed, I think that the two words that came to mind most clearly for me were the words of empathy and forgiveness. Now, bear with me just for a second while I walk you through that. Um, I remember uh, walking through uh, Tibet about, oh, say 20 years ago, and thinking long and hard about the word forgiveness. And thinking, what does that really mean? Is it to let someone off the hook? Is it to be free? What, what is this, this thing called forgiveness? And I walked and walked and journeyed uh, for three weeks. And I had been in the Himalayas many times before. And a friend who I first went with, Simon Chervon, said, some people come here and never go home. Some people come here and are never the same. I was one who was never the same. There was a clarity of thought. Was it away from other people? Was it an ability to think? But there was a clarity. And I remember, like many other sort of silly Westerners, going to the Himalayas and thinking this through. And one of my last stops uh, on this journey uh, was a place outside of, uh, of, outside of Lhasa, Tibet, uh, where the Karmapa Lama resided. And shortly uh, after I arrived and we made camp nearby, we had a, um, an audience with the Karmapa Lama, and I remember thinking deeply about this. Several months later, he secretly fled uh, Tibet. I went back to America, and I have to confess, uh, was as clueless about the words of empathy and forgiveness as I was when I started my journey. But that journey changed as dramatically as when I picked up and left Johns Hopkins. When I sat and listened to a father of a child with a disease, but it was not any disease. It was an energy disease. And he told me that my life would change and I would understand him when I had a child of my own. Understanding, empathy. So this is best, of course, summed up by people far more erudite and clearer than I. Cahill Gibran talks about our custodial role in having a child. So, and I'm very um, loath to give out advice. I think that everyone's journey is their journey. It's a journey of unexpected paths. Uh, but I will tell you the heuristic that I pass to the most important uh, person in my life, as it were, as a parent, which is our child. And we call them daddy's big three. And it's a heuristic. It's not a mandate. They are tools. And ironically, these tools, when I sat back to think about Anne's homework assignment, paradoxically, they're all about energy, emotional energy, in love, spiritual energy, in relaxing, and intellectual energy, in pride, and a series of words that a one-year-old could understand 
and perhaps a 90-year-old. A set of tools to take one forward. So when I thought to reconcile these words that I had spent many years thinking about, forgiveness and empathy, I noticed weren't they just the other side of understanding and freedom, the ability to pursue your life, not a pre-prescribed life, the ability to let go and venture forward, the ability to understand core values of a path of a life, ironically, somehow intermeshed in this question of energy. This karmic-like Mobius strip that defined my life, always never crossing an edge, but coming back through a journey to ask the same question in multiple different forms, caring for the patient, understanding life, helping a father with a child with a rare disease, being a friend, a father, a husband, all of those things were the same manifestation of the same core question. I, of course, am not the first person to contemplate this, and in fact, am probably an amateur in doing so. Many people have talked about the essence of energy. But what makes me unique, and the analog for everyone in the room, is this, not the relevance of energy, but what I was destined to figure out is how does this thing work? How does it work? That's my question. That is the question I was put here to solve. Now, Lovelock talked about order and life and energy. These unified principles that, of course, we know form the basis of all of life. That translation between the inanimate and the animate. But how, in fact, did this occur? So the journey that I've been on is to understand how, in fact, these two pieces mesh together to form what we call life. And through a journey of fixing children, learning, and applying, it turns out that miraculously, in our genome, are 584 objects that do energy. These objects are small transistors. They're an intracellular fiber optic system that I and my team have been working on tirelessly for over 10 years to understand. At the center of that <clears throat> constellation is a key understanding of why children with rare diseases succumb and the ability to build drugs to perhaps fix them. But what stands behind them is an entire network, an entire network that synthesizes, moves, regulates energy effectively an intracellular fiber optic system that, as Lovelock suggested, would be based on the fundamental building blocks of the modern genome, coupled with the language of where physics meets the biology world, powered by one item, energy. So it's been my destiny to follow this and track it from beginning to end. And thank you very much for your time.